Okay, folks, welcome to this evening's cabaret. So, to, today's talk we're going to go around is it's the Hell Maintainer track, and we're looking at where we are now, where we're trying to go next, how people can get involved. So, before I kick off, can everybody stand up, please? We're going to go with this old party trick, okay? Now, we, we've been away a long time, and this is my first time on the road. It's my first time back at KubeCon since 2000, and help me out here, 19, yeah, 2019. So, can everyone, whatever you're comfortable with, give an elbow, a fist pump, a high five, if you want to shake hands to the person beside you? I am, I'm shorter than the entire first row. Boom. Okay. What's gone on yes, for the last two years and the whole lot? What's going on at the moment, it's great to be able to get out again. So, welcome to all of you making it here to QCon, okay? Yes! All right. So, let's grab a seat. Um, my name is Martin Hickey. I work over at IBM. And my uh, fellow co-presenters today are Andrew Block, who's over at Red Hat. Uh, Scott Rigby, who's over at WeWorks. And Matt Butcher, who's over at Fairmont, and the CEO of Fairmont. So, uh, Welcome. Right, so basic agenda what we're going to do today, as I said, first of all, you know, because the maintainer tracks now have been pushed into one, we'll do an intro for anyone that hasn't seen Helm before. And uh, then we're going to look at any of the new features we've done since the last uh, KubeCon, which was in LA, was it? Yep. Yep. And then probably one of the big things we're looking at is how you want to, to get involved or how you can participate or contribute to the project. And then finally, we, we'll see where we're going next. So let's kick it off. So I put up here two sentences taken from the Helm website called helm.sh, if you're looking for it. And I suppose everyone has that definition of that Helm is the package manager for Kubernetes. And I think that's a really, really good definition. But what does it mean? So I suppose what it means is it allows you to take these packages or charts, which is the package format in, for, uh, that uh, Helm uses, to deploy apps out into the cluster. So it allows you to do that CRUD. Your, you know, your creates updates, deletes of the particular apps. But also, and probably it's one of the key parts of it is, is that ability to share. This ability to be able to deploy an app, and we've talked about this a few times, mm -hmm. Matt, haven't we, where, you know, people often take Helm to understand what the name of goodness is Kubernetes doing underneath the hood. Mm -hmm. You know, because you can just take a chart, and when you see it in a while, you can just go Helm install, and bang, there's your app, deployed out into cluster, even with probably, you know, sub apps in it, maybe a database, I don't know, maybe a Redis cache, whatever, uh, deployed with it. So it gives you that power, I suppose, without having to delve into the resource objects. Now, if you're a chart maintainer and all that, yes, you understand that, okay? So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to do a little example that a former colleague of mine did, oh, a good few years ago, and his lovely video online, you'll see the link down there. It's a nice little nine, nine minute video. Now it's slightly out of date because it was more pitched for Helm 2 when the architecture was slightly different and the commands were slightly different, but it's still the same concept. But I'm gonna grab his idea of this e-commerce e app. So he had the idea of it, you have an e-commerce app and the holidays you might, you know, um, you, might ups, you might upscale it, uh, you might increase the replicas on it. So for the amount of traffic that's going on. Now, my one isn't going to be that fancy. We'll see in a minute what is the image of this app called. Uh, but the idea here is this is kind of the design you're looking at. So we'll, we'll, we'll just imagine for this that the MongoDB has been deployed into the database already, and that's for your persistence. And what we're going to deploy here is two replicas um, of our Node.js app, and then we're going to use a server object so we can talk to our app, basically, so that it can, we can reach it from outside your uh, cluster. So if you're going to do this normally using Kubernetes, and most of you are experts here, I would say, and if you're not, it's around these manifest files. So write in your YAML files, whether you like YAML, whether you don't like YAML, there's probably a lot of discussions on this one. Some people do, some people don't. Some <laughs> no people think words. it's just a version of JSON, or the other way around, whatever you want. But what I've done here is I've just extracted two bits out of each um, YAML files. The deployment file for deploying out the deployment, i.e. your pods and then your, your containers and then the service then for connecting to it. And you can see here, I've, I've put the image and the replica, our image, we're gonna have a Santa app, all right? So if any of you have kids out there, you might have to go to the Santa app every year and see where Santa is at that time of year. So 
we'll put that out there with two replicas on it. And with the, with the, um, the service object, we're going to go with node port. You normally wouldn't do that. You'd probably do a load balancer if you're on, on a particular cluster that would support that. And it's going to be exposed on port 8080. So I won't put the question, what's the command you run? Obviously, it's uh, uh, kubectl or whatever you want to call it yourself. And we'll deploy the, um, we'll deploy the files out. They'll get handled by the Kubernetes API server, and it'll deploy the different objects or resources into the cluster. And the next thing, wham, bam, your Santa app is up and running. People can access it from a particular uh, IP on the port 88. All right? But what happens if we say to ourselves here, okay, this is very simple. This is very easy, all right? But if we want to deploy another instance of, of the Santa app, a separate instance in the cluster, we now need to go into those manifest files and change them, okay? Or if we want to change the replicas. Now, that's okay if you own the app, but what happens if your app is quite a big application? It needs a database and underneath it. There's quite a lot of configuration. Uh, you might be handing it over to someone, or else you want other people in, in, in your company or in other companies to be able to install this app for you. You're now getting into a situation here where you know, you're going to be playing around with manifest files. You know, um, and really what is the common denominator in all this is your configuration, you're changing, okay? So what ha happens, what, what would it be like if we had something where we can take that configuration, pull it out of the manifest files, and just make those changes on the fly? You know, while we're doing the, while we're doing the apply or whatever, we can just make that change. <laughs> that's kind of what, what you'd be looking for, and that's where the value is in it. So that's where Helm comes into it. So if you were going to deploy this with Helm, we now end up with this. So you're probably sitting there going, oh great, I two little small manifest files, now you're after sticking another YAML file up on top, you know, you're, ju you're just increasing my workload here, or my maintenance. But you're not. What we've done here now is, and this is where what Helm brings you, one of the first things that Helm brings you is putting that extra bit of templating on top of the manifest files. So that bit of logic around the, the Go templating language, and I know uh, Matt, who is one of the co-creators of Helm, talked about in a talk there this week about <laughs> one of the decisions he made at the time was if he now could go back in time, he would be even not to use Go templating. Because there's a lot of discussion out there, Go templating won't do this for me, that won't do that for me. Yes, there are restrictions to it. But really the key behind it was to give you that extra layer where you could put in configuration and small bits of logic. Now we've seen people put crazy logic into it and then go, well, why doesn't it work in that situation? So there are limits to how you extend it, but it does give you the basic logic on it. And we can see here now our configurations put into a value file, okay? So with this set up now, that's all wrapped, all the common files that you need now are wrapped in um, a package of format, which is called a chart in Helm. And a chart is the thing we share. And there's a lot of, I can see Scott was involved a lot in it. I can see Paul here, Kachowski here as well. He was involved in a lot of chart maintenance and a lot of chart creation over the years. And, and, what, and the power that brought to a lot of people to deploy all sorts of uh, apps from WordPress to whatever you want, Ingress, etc. cetera. Um, and when we go to deploy that now, we can see here, very similar to kubectl, and you're probably saying, where's the value in this now? It's just a different command, it's helm install, you give it the name of your release, and then the particular chart, which is called my chart. Again, the same thing is happening, you're talking to Kubernetes server, uh, or the Kubernetes API server, but what happens before it sends it to Kubernetes API server is, it renders all this logic, pulling all the configuration into a manifest file, and the manifest files are sent to the Kubernetes API server, exactly like how kubectl does it. And a lot of the logic around uh, your authentication authorization is the same. Uh, it uses the whole idea of the, of the config files, et cetera, like kubectl does. So you're probably saying, yeah, I've got that now. What else can I do with this? So if we now want to make a change on the fly, so if we were doing this with, I suppose, our pure manifest files uh, through Kubernetes, now, I know someone's going to pipe up and say, but there's a command in kubectl to change the replicas. Yes, you're right. But let's say if there was, I don't know, if there was far more configuration in it, your options are to either pull down the apps that you've run in and redeploy with the changes in manifest files, or go in editing manifest files on, on the fly. Hands up here, anyone who's ever edited, man, deployed manifest files on the fly. 
hand, keep your hands up if you've made mistakes while doing that and made a mess of your cluster. Okay, all right. So these things happen, all right? What Kubernetes is, it gives you, or sorry, what Helm gives you is two commands. First one is upgrade, which means you want to upgrade or change the deployment you've already done. So how does Helm know about the deployment it's already made? Because it keeps that metadata in the cluster. It keeps it in the secret in the cluster, and it knows then when it's going to do an upgrade here, it's going to do a delta. So I come along now and I say, I change our replicas. All right, Santa's gone. The whole house is fed up of Santa at this stage. <laughs> Let just one replica run in so that if someone wants to go and check up did Santa arrive or not, okay? So we change it to one, and then we use the Helm upgrade. Again, we give it the release name and the chart, okay? Now, the release name is important because they're different instances of the deployment. So with now with Helm, you can install at different times using the one chart. And you're just changing your configuration on the fly. That configuration can be broken into different value files, and you can also set different configuration on the command line as well as you're doing that. Mm. A lot of tools build on top of it, like Helm file. Um, I'm trying to think of one or two others. They build on top of that, 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 of that functionality because you know, if you want to have different environments like production, uh, test, development, whatever you want, it's often better to use the likes of Helm file because it's built in for doing that more than um, Helm itself. And also, if you afterwards then, if you made a mistake while you're doing that, you can use the rollback command, which is just replace upgrade with uh, rollback, and then which version you want to go back to. At all times, you'll be able to see then what instances are applied using commands like Helm list, etc. Just have a look at the documentations because I don't want to go too much into it today. Right, so we mentioned as well, one of the other key parts was sharing is caring. I don't know if you had that phrase growing up. None mm -hmm. of us wanted to share our sweets with any siblings <coughs> or anybody else, but there you go. We were always taught sharing is caring. And here, it really, really helps, okay? So here, you have the ability to deploy a particular app out without knowing anything about the chart. And sometimes people do that, and uh, they have great fun with it. But a lot of maintainers have created charts over the years. Uh, they're now being hosted on their own, um, uh, in their own uh, repositories, etc. And the ability to be able to take, you know, uh, whatever you're looking to deploy, you know, it's used for operators, it's used for deploying operators, it's used for deploying WordPress, Ingress, I don't know, whatever you're looking to deploy, you can deploy from. So, this is where the key comes in here, is the value here that these charts can be shared. Now, down here in the bottom, this was how we always share charts up to, I'll say, this last release that we know, which is 3.9, am I right? 3.8. 3.8. It was, it was available as of 3.8. Oh yeah, OCA. sorry, I've jumped the gun. 3.9 is on the way, it's an RC, okay? Yeah. Um, so, it went in tr so this is how you'd normally did it before, and these were, called uh, Helm chart repositories. They're essentially HTTP servers with an index in it. You could put it on GitHub, you could use GitHub pages, there was Chart Museum, etc. you probably used it. Um, but now, uh, OCI support has gone GA uh, in 3.8, yep. And um, you now have the ability to do it from an OCI registry. Hands up, anybody who knows what an OCI registry is. Okay. For those who may not, um, these are a standard of uh, what were originally for Docker-style registries, how you, how, you, how you store your images, your container images. Uh, Docker helped uh, set up uh, the OCI or put the first spec, and then eventually that spec went 1.0 last, mm, last year, November maybe sometime, or maybe the year before, I'm losing a sense of it. So uh, what it gave you then was the ability to put different artifacts into um, what would traditionally have been a container registry or an image registry, you now can put Helm charts into it. The command is slightly different because you want to tell it what the protocol is. And also down here at the bottom, you can see here, my repo is an alias. You can't put an alias in for OCI registries, but folks will go through that in a minute. So, so you can see here, you now have the ability to install anything without knowing exactly what it's about, but you can get your app in there and you don't have to know about Kubernetes resources, etc. Right. So where are these charts, these magical charts? And if you haven't seen them before. So <coughs> up to about a year, about two years ago, there was a main chart repository, the Helm chart repository. You'll still find it out there. It's now gone end of life. That initially was started as a sample ID for folks 
to be able to use traps and go. What happened was it became a huge beast of a thing with massive amount of charts and there was a small group of people trying to maintain it, Paul being one of them, Scott, uh, Matt Freena and others, okay? It became unmanageable and unmaintainable. So the decision came that, look, if you're going to create a chart, you need to host that chart yourself and you need to maintain that chart. So what has happened is all these charts, and, and Bitnami have been great at the front of this, they've taken all their charts, I don't know what they call Bitnami, they're, they're still they're still Bitnami, I suppose they're VMware, yeah. Um, they've taken all their charts and they've set up a chart repository with them. I don't know now if they'll go down the, the OCI route, we'll see. And uh, you can get them there. But it would be nice to have one location, and that's where the Artifact Hub came in here. So this isn't, this is just a search engine, essentially, or a, market, or a marketplace tool where you can go in and you can check for different artifacts. Now, it started out with the Helm Hub, which was just for Helm charts, and then through um, Dan, who passed away, um, his idea was to make it for all artifacts that are out there. So you can see there's a list of them down there. Uh, you probably find a few of your favorite ones in there. Okay, so you can go in and have a search there. And when you search for your particular chart you're looking for, it will give you all details about the chart. It also does scanning, etc., on the chart, and you few other nice things that keep being added to it. So it's always ongoing. Yeah. So if you want it, you go and look it for there. You get the URL and you can use it then. So to conclude on this is, so we've looked at a, a you know, I suppose a, a kind of a, a, a typical scenario you might have today about uh, deploying apps out into a cluster or whatever, and we've looked at the ability that Helm brings you to extract out those um, configuration files and then the ability to share through charts after that. So I'm going to just hand over now to Andy. Yep. Okay, so thank you. Thank you, sir. Please. All right. Andy. How many is that? Yes. So anyways. So okay, yeah. <laughs> So in the latest release of Helm, what were some of the newest features that came out? Nope. Big one, OCI registry. We talked about how many people are using it. How many are actually building and producing images, or probably charts, and storing them in OCI registries? Raise a hand. How many are planning on doing that? Why would you want to do that? Why do you want to go down a OCI registry versus a Helm registry, repository. Anyone? It's less infrastructure. I don't want to maintain another source. If you're producing content, you probably are using a container registry. Why not use it for something else? So that's exactly what we try to, that, that we try to do here is we now give you an easier vehicle to be able to share and consume Helm charts. For those of you who are not familiar with it, it is a way that you can store it within a container registry. However, very important to note that there are some commands that are not really applicable to OCI charts. The Helm repo and the Helm search, they really don't work very well because they're mainly meant to maintain Helm repositories. And this whole effort took a long time. Probably three full releases? I think three, you six? Mean, you mean... Uh, to actually go DA. The full, oh, to actually the full, do the final push? The final yeah, push. There was releases, probably about three but then like years in the making. Oh, years in the making. <laughs> so we, we should probably do three. a handout to uh, Josh Jozinkin. Yes. did most of the work on this. He put an awful lot of effort in with the OCI and all that. So, Same yeah. with Matt Farina as well, helped Matt as well. As well. Yeah. 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 And in addition, there were members of the Oris project who helped us get over that finish line with a couple final final features. So really a great open source success story here. One note that I wanted to call out is that if you're using OCI registry or OCI charts, there is a dependency on what registry you use. As we mentioned, OCI artifacts are somewhat new. Not every single container registry supports it. Do you notice one pretty big one that's not on that list there? Okay, AWS, right. it does support it. Docker Hub. Docker Hub does not support it, which is... But it's coming. It's coming, but right now it doesn't. We've got confirmation in Slack that this is a high priority for, for Docker. But, from the top. but that's the but, number one yeah. thing is that if you start out with Docker and containers, you probably had a Docker Hub account. You may have gone somewhere else or used something else now, but I know I have one still. I yeah. try pushing my chart. I get a nice friendly error. What what I screw up? So that really it comes down to it doesn't support it quite yet. It's coming. Other features that came out recently is 
validation time uh, enhancements. So we now validate the release name at installation time, as well as we also have some post-rendering support. How many of you are using post-rendering hooks? We now support argument passing. So you can go ahead and pass arguments to it. I know Paul's happy. <laughs> Uh, in addition, we added some maintenance features. Number one, we upgraded the libraries for Kubernetes to 124. Obviously, there is dependencies on what APIs you're leveraging as well as what target cluster you're using. I have some friends of mine who are using a very, very, very old version of Kubernetes. It does not work as well because some of the APIs have been deprecated and have been removed in the latest releases. So there warning there, folks, just, you know, when Kubernetes changes APIs, it does affect us in uh, Helm, uh, because we have to expose some of the uh, kubectl API. Mm -hmm. And that happened in the last release, which was three, which happened in this release 3.9, because we have to keep up support with the latest yep. version of Kubernetes. It also happens sometimes if you've deployed in a cluster with objects that were being deprecated and have been removed, and you upgrade your cluster, you get caught as well for that. But we've a tool around that. That's something we can't it, it's out of our control, uh, and it's all down to Kubernetes doesn't uh, obey this. But we do have well, a known version policy, we do. right? That's yeah. not, we have a known yeah. version policy, and I, I'll also recommend it. And I'll, I'll come to you in a second, sir. Um, oh, go ahead. Supports whatever the currently supported versions of Kubernetes that Kubernetes upstream yeah. supports. So yeah. Currently, so you'd stay releases. on. Yeah. So you'd yeah. stay on the version you're on. Yeah. yeah. You'd see the matrix table to see which version of Kubernetes it is. Yeah. Yep. I think that was it. Oh, and uh, one thing I wanted to note is if you want to know about some of the features, deprecations, etc., the Kubernetes blog always has a very detailed blog about the release, and especially when there's a deprecation, you'll see a special blog specifically on deprecations. I'm going to turn it over to you, yes. Ms. Ms. Mr. Scott. Yes. Thank you. Scott's going to go ahead. Yay. I'll come over All right. Uh, whoop. I'm going to go the correct direction. Uh, OK, so getting involved. Um, the first thing to say is uh, we really do want you to be involved. Um, and I uh, just wanted to first start out by saying that you know, when Helm started, before I got involved, uh, but even when I got involved, it was a, it was a, a, a bit of a smaller group, you mm -hmm. know? And um, Kubernetes was also uh, a bit younger. Uh, Kubernetes is very mature, and Helm is a very mature project at this point. And so it can also be, you know, I, I can understand for, uh, for folks that might be newer to the community, um, as well as people that have been around for a while but haven't, haven't really contributed in those areas, it can be a little intimidating. Um, please don't allow that to be the case for yourself, because it's, it, it, really, it really doesn't have to be. Um, First of all, by the maintainers, we really want more contributors. Um, and the fact that there are a lot of pull requests in there is, <laughs> that are not reviewed yet is not an indication of a lack of interest in, in, uh, in contributions. It's just a lack of people to do it. Uh, not a lack, but a, 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 a limit, a finite number of people to do this. Bandwidth. Bandwidth is a problem. Yeah. So, so <clears throat> and I'll get to that in a second on another slide. But, but basically, I just want to start out with a, like, a huge welcome. Like, please, if you have... Uh, literally any thoughts, interests in being involved in the Helm community. Um, some of you already are, but for those who, who aren't yet, um, please give it a shot. And I'll just go over a couple of the ways that you can do that. So one of, one of the, oh, I'm going to stay on camera here. Uh, one of the easiest ways um, to, to do this is to make contributions to the website. So the website's at helm.sh. The docs are in the, the docs uh, you know, um, directory or the docs path for the website, but the source code is here. So um, github.com, if you can't read, uh, slash helm, slash helm, dash www. Um, that's where all the, you don't really need to know, uh, um, well, you don't actually need to know how to operate Kubernetes in order to, to contribute to the project. You probably do want to know a bit about Helm, or at least try to figure out a bit about Helm in order to contribute to the documentation. But fresh eyes are really important too. So even folks that don't know a lot about that, um, if something seems unclear to you, if you know, I would say use the docs as a as as a way to learn about Helm. Like you know, just go through them and go through the examples. And if it doesn't immediately solve your questions, if it doesn't seem clear, 
um, if you're not getting to where you want to go, uh, let someone know, and we can help. And if you have, we can help you uh, uh, refine the ideas about what might make, make them more clear. And if you submit a PR to make this more clear, we will gladly review it and and uh, merge it, and you'll you'll have your name on the list of contributors. Um, yeah, uh, Bridget does a lot of the reviews of, of, of uh, the website. Uh, Karen uh, does once in a while, right, too? I, I do. I <laughs> do. needs boredom to do it. Yeah, you're like, I'm not, I'm not signing up for this. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, um, you know, I do as well. Uh, other, others do. So, so please do, and feel free, um, at least for me, to reach out to me on Slack or Twitter or whatever. Um, I'm easy to find, right? And other maintainers, I think when, if folks are generally like pleasant, fine. Uh, the one note I want to make about this is that one thing that's not super welcome um, are PRs that, uh, let's say, just sort of, uh, it's like one spelling character off, or maybe there's like one period that's changed, or like the order of a list is changed slightly. A lot of those pull requests are, we do want you to contribute. We want your name in the, 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 the list of people who have contributed, but we only want we want you to contribute something. We don't want uh, just a name, so we don't want to. It, it should system. have. It should have impact for the community. Yeah, in in any way, even if it's just clarifying language or any anything. It doesn't have to be big, it, but but it does have to be something that's not just trying to get your name on there for just without actually tr doing anything. But uh, I suppose of if if someone's starting at the start, it it's okay. Yeah, you know, yeah, to yeah. put it in, and you're trying to get going, and what Scott is it, saying as well is when you're going through the documentation, that's a nice place. You know, if you're trying to figure out how to deploy your environment and you find issues then, that's a great place for yeah. you to push PR, PR. And don't worry if you think, oh, I can't push that. That's, that's just a simple PR in front of me. Go for it. You know what I mean? Because you are contributing and you're learning as you go along as well. Yeah. Thanks, Martin. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, 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 well said. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so, yeah, and, and, we, and we'll work with, with, with anyone who wants to make a PR, regardless of what you find, to make that of some substance for yourself and perhaps the next person that follows you. Yep. So, um, okay, uh, that's, where you, that's what you could do. There's, that's how you do it. And uh, you know, I mentioned reaching out on Slack. Here's the Slack stuff. Uh, so inside Kubernetes Slack is where, um, you know, I know we're at uh, Cloud Native Con and, and KubeCon, but you know, um, uh, Helm, as many of you know, was part of Kubernetes early, early on, part of the Kubernetes org, and was split, split out to be its own project in order to, for, for Kubernetes to to maintain the focus it wanted. Um, Helm is always a big part of the Kubernetes community, right? So uh, from, from Helm's inception, anyway. And that's why it's there instead of in the CNCF Slack. So there's there, just so many. There users. is a channel in CNCF Slack, but we typically, if anyone posts to it, we'll just go ahead and just point them yeah, over. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, feel free to join the Helm channel in CNCF Slack. I'm in there, but I don't think I ever look at it. I don't, <laughs> I don't no. think any of the maintainers look at it. So, so, so yeah, so go in uh, the, you know, the Kubernetes Slack. And uh, Helm Users is a great place to go for any, any kind of question, any kind of idea, thought, whatever. Um, Helm Dev is really where development happens. And if somebody has interest in helping on that level, that's where we can discuss anything, whether it's just extending it for yourself in your own company or in your own project or, or contributing to the project in some way. Um, and then uh, the charts channel is still up and running. So as, as um, Martin was saying before, the uh, um, the stable and incubator Helm repositories, if, uh, for those of you that remember those, is no longer a central place, um, even though the, the artifacts from those old charts are still hosted. Um, you're going to have different, different, uh, different distributed Helm repositories, um, but anything that relates to any of those charts is still discussable in there because there's a lot of commonality. Um, and, uh, yeah, I don't really honestly check that as much as I as <laughs> much as I used to. So, uh, so if you want to ping me, feel free, but I, I might not see it otherwise. Uh, but someone will, and people can share tick, trips, excuse me, tricks and tips. Uh, there you go. There you go. <laughs> yeah, trips and ticks. You know, uh, for 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 being a Helm user and writing charts even for for yourself and uh, your own private charts. So, um, okay. So so yeah. You know, really, for, for folks who do want to try doing that, I was saying, you know, go through the documentation. Uh, please do um, follow that to go ahead and you can run, you can run Helm yourself, you know, like it's a, it's a Go project. Uh, you can run it on your own laptop. Um, you can test it out and 
yeah, that can really help. I think the document help, the documentation, for those interested, again, this is not a pressure to do that. Um, this is kind of me recruiting you in a way, or trying to for folks who are interested, but it's not really, you're, you're very welcome to a Helm user and never contribute anything, right? Um, but uh, but if, you, if you want to try, and if you want to just sort of see how it works, um, please just follow the docs and let us know if anything's, anything's off. And again, we can go, go back to that first slide for, for, for what happens if you find something that could be improved. Um, and then, uh, and then, yeah, um, opening issues in the appropriate GitHub repository. Um, it's really just GitHub uh, Helm slash Helm um, is where the Helm project is, and then there are Helm sub projects within that. Um, I won't go over all of them right now for the sake of time, but uh, but it's fairly easy to find the info about that. And also, again, in Slack, you can ask us, and we can help point you to the right repository. Um, yeah, open issues. We we love issues, um, and. Uh, and so th this last one is, you know, kind of what I was alluding to before. That, you know, one of, the, and 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 what I think uh, Andy Andy mirrored back when he said bandwidth, right? Like, we have a lot of people that want to contribute to Helm. Um, there's always several hundred pull requests open at any given time, no matter what we do. If we go yeah. through and spend like a whole week triaging, we we could like basically all get together for a whole week and sit down and just like keep going. We do that, and we'll 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 either we'll either uh, improve, close, merge, or whatever needs to happen. Like, except in uh, those pull requests, right? And we could close like 50 of them, we could close 100 of them. And what happens is the very next day, the very next week, that sort of emboldens folks to be like, "Oh, right, you know, they're reviewing PRs more." And the next thing you know, we've got another 400 PRs. So, it's not it's not a Sisyphean task when a lot of people contribute, and we have had periods of time like that. Um, and we're looking for more time like that. So if you want to give a hand, did you have a thought? Yeah. No, finish up. Oh, oh, yeah. If you want to give a hand, please do. And we, we really want you to, to join us. And if you need help, like, what does it mean to review a PR? We will walk you through. We've got a whole process. Yeah. So. And a lot of times, building the PR and testing it and just saying, hey, I built this manually and tested it is helpful. Likewise, with responding to issues, one of the most frequent time sinks for the developers is trying to figure out how to reproduce some of these issues. So just going, hey, yeah, this broke for me too. This was my system. This is how I set it up. This is what happened. Here's the output. Oftentimes, even if it appears to be a duplicate of previous ones, we can then go, oh, oh, here's the subtle difference. You know, it was off by one minor release or something like that. So those kinds of things are great for us. They save us serious amounts of time. And if you're a developer, you may be a, a Node.js developer or not a Golang developer. Just building the project just gets your system, yourself, understanding the workflow of Golang development. So it really helps not only for this project, which is what you'd be focusing on, but also other projects in the Kubernetes space, just because many of them are Golang based. And I suppose one other aspect then is that if you have Kubernetes experience, then in the issues queue is quite good as well, because we get a lot of Kubernetes questions and issues that aren't actually Helm. So people jumping in, I know there's a person, Joe, at the moment that's doing that and stuff. And probably the last thing to say in it as well is, Helm isn't just the CLI and you use them directly. There's a lot of projects out there at the moment. Um, in Scott's company and WeWorks with Flux, they're wrapping Helm. Uh, Argo CD wraps Helm. Operator SDK does. So if you're using any of those tools or your company's using any of those tools, then giving back into Helm is, will be very, very valuable and um, uh, beneficial to you and your company. Cool. And, and uh, I'm going to pass it off to, to Matt in a, in a moment for what's next. But really, right before we wrap up this section, we've got about five minutes left total here. So um, we, we, have, we have a process for um, a contributor ladder process. Here, this says maintainer ladder because we're focusing on the maintainership. If you want to go a step further, and if you, you know, like, if you, if you contribute um, even just one thing, that is great. And applause, and like, we'll basically, like, you know, send you like cookie emojis, or at least I will. Uh, you know, like <laughs> everything, whatever you want, you know. Uh, any emoji you want is what I'm saying, uh, m mostly. Um, uh, <laughs> But um, if you make one contribution, you know, there have been a lot of people that have contributed to the project only once over the years. And, you know, why not try another one? You know what I mean? Like, why not, why not stay for a bit? Why not, uh, you know, kick your shoes off a little? I don't know. Feel welcome to, to not just do, let's say, a drive-by contribution. Again, I'm not <laughs> saying don't do one. But if you're going to, you know, uh, maybe, maybe do two. Maybe see if it, if it works for you. 
we'd really love that because get, get a second round. Yeah, get a second round, right? Yeah, you know, uh, whatever analogy you want, and 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 it just helps us, and to help you and and each person can help each other as they get more familiar with the project. So um, once that happens, though, sustained contributions of 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 whatever kind, um, we we want more maintainers for Helm. So that Helm has different sub projects, and Helm has a core maintainership. There's um, you can start off by being a triage maintainer. That helps with, anyway, that's, that, that's uh, I'm just going to fly through them real quick. That's uh, folks that have uh, more permissions to work on issue, to, to, to change labels and work on issues and PRs. Um, the core maintainer is people that sustain the Helm Helm project, and the org maintainer are people that work for governance. So uh, there's a whole wide open field for you, and I'm going to pass it off to Matt. Thanks. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So I'm quickly going to just talk about where we've been, where we're going. Uh, I did a back of the napkin calculation a couple of weeks ago. If you have a small, rather successful open source project with a couple thousand users and you introduce a breaking change, given about the average for what it costs a software developer or DevOps engineer, uh, and it impacts only around 10% of your user base, right? It cost a couple thousand dollars, you know, amortized across your whole user base, right? So a lot of times when you're a small open source project, introducing a breaking change is bad, but not horrible. But as you get larger and larger, uh, that the, the number goes up, right? And when I started running it for the latest numbers of Kubernetes, even with only a, a bug or a, a, a breaking change that impacted only one in ten people, and took only a small amount of time to find and fix the numbers that I was coming up with were upwards of $145 million. And I'm thinking, that is a very profound way to look at the cost of a breaking change, very literally, right? Even if it's a minor breaking change, it costs a lot of people, you know, opportunity costs and time spent fixing this kind of thing, frustration, sometimes downtime, and money. And so, you know, Helm has for a long time had a fairly rigid policy, it's actually written down, about what we consider a breaking change, when we will introduce breaking changes, spoiler, only during a major version change, and the lengths that we will go to in order to avoid making those kinds of changes. Now, uh, on occasion, people interpret that and go, oh, so the project's basically not doing anything interesting anymore, right? But that's not the case. We're just trying to make sure that we operate at a cadence that allows people to predict, oh, I need to spend more time preparing for this release because it will have breaking changes. Oh, this one's a minor or a patch release. I can be more confident that I can roll it out quickly and not have to worry about a nasty surprise in production. So because of that, then, <laughs> you can kind of frame out this slide. Uh, don't use Helm 2, by the way. If you are using Helm 2, you are in security hot water. It hasn't been maintained in over 1.5 years. Helm 3 is the current stable major release. Uh, for the most part, the last big feature we wanted to have in Helm 3 was OCI. It took us a lot longer than we wanted, and we introduced it very slowly. It had an experimental flag so that we could keep operating on it up until we were confident that it was ready for production, and we put that one out in two releases ago now. So with that one, we're planning a couple minor features that will roll out. Largely, Helm 3, we're just going to try and keep it stable, keep it usable. When you find a bug, you know, we want to get that fixed. Uh, when, we, when we find a security kind of thing, we will you know, move the earth in order to try and get that fixed. But we won't be introducing any more large features in Helm 3. So Helm 4 is coming. Uh, we, have, we, we have begun sort of the informal stage of planning for Helm 4. But again, when we think about the impact of a large project uh, making big changes and the community having to adopt it in existing production clusters and things like the production environments, we want to be very intentional about it and very careful. And so as we go into Helm 4, we're requiring that all new major features and many new minor features have to be completely written, the design proposal has to be completely written so that everybody can kind of take a look at it and say, yeah, this is good, this is bad, did you think about these cases over here? So we have a process called the Helm Improvement Proposal Process uh, that, that we're asking developers to walk through, uh, contributors to walk through as we plan <coughs> out the new things awesome. for Helm 4. Uh, we've been using this process for two and a half, three years, years, I think yeah. now, yeah, for yeah. features in Helm 3, and it has worked out very well, I Based know. Off the cap. 
It started, yeah, yeah, it was inspired by KEP, yeah. KEP and the uh, Python improvement proposals. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, And so we've been using it for a while. We're getting fairly <laughs> confident. I know it can be burdensome to write a document and then have to deal with comments and things like that, but largely the, uh, the benefits have, have way outweighed uh, the cost of that. So, uh, you know, on the bottom of these are actually the same link both times, but the github.com slash helm slash community repository has a directory in it called HIPS, and that's where all the Helm improvement proposals are. You can see every one from uh, HIP000, which describes the HIP process through the latest proposed ones. And then if you go and look in the PR queue, you'll see the ones that haven't yet passed through uh, the, the process of review. Uh, but that's how we're planning on doing Helm 4. Uh, as we look at those and see the ones that, uh, that kind of bubble to the top and, and, and the compelling cases made, we will begin the development process for Helm 4. But we're not really in a huge hurry at this point. Uh, in part because we need more maintainers. Uh, so again, you know, if there's if there's a hard call to action, it's uh, you know, help us maintain Helm. We would love that. We appreciate it very much. And there's an easy call to action, which is if you want to chat with us, you can come over to the Helm booth. Uh, I, I, for one, will be going over there right after this talk. Uh, and if you wouldn't mind, you know, scanning that QR code and playing the game that is at the other end, it's called like fill in the survey or something like that. Uh, very fun. Uh, but if you could do those kinds of things, those would be very helpful to us. Uh, again, just to sort of wrap up and conclude with the common theme across all of these, you know, we have been working for a long time on Helm in order to make it a good solid project for the community. Uh, at this point, we are sort of a slow moving project, but we're doing it in a way that is intentional because we, what, we, what we want to do is help build something that accrues the most benefit to the community. Uh, and our big, big needs right now are just more people helping out in small ways and big ways uh, around the community. So thank you all very much for coming today. And again, thanks to uh, my co-presenters. Uh, see you at the Helm booth. Thank you. Super good. Sorry for uh, giving you less time than I wanted. The better, right? Eh?